I know a man in Christ um, who has a past. We all have a past. But this in particular man that I know, uh, you know, made some bad choices, um, fell into sin, and uh, fell into just a lifestyle of sin and drugs and partying and things like that. And uh, I've heard his story before. I can relate to a lot of it, but it's a remarkable story. It could probably be a movie. And, um, you know, now he's a Christian and whatnot. But uh, in his past life, he developed a deadly sickness uh, due to the consequences and the choices that he made. And, um, you know, it was an infectious disease and uh, he had to go through all these treatment programs and hospitals and, and things like that. And uh, they said, oh, it's incurable and all of that. And, you know, you got to take these certain medicines. And, and he said, <clears throat> he said, you know, I, I sat there and I listened to all that the doctor had to say. And um, he was reading me the, the CDC stats and, and all of this and you know, how there's this deadly sickness within this individual and, and uh, you know, and he, he, he said, you know, the doctor kept bringing up that this is the most severe thing and, and that you're going to be affected by this for the rest of your life. And he said, D do you have any questions, you know, for the professional? <laughs> And uh, this individual said to the doctor, he said, well, first and foremost, there's consequences to sin. And that doesn't mean that you can't be forgiven by Jesus Christ. And um, he went on to uh, tell the doctor that we all are spiritually diseased in the sight of a holy God. Every one of us. And he said that something that was very profound. He said, we're all in a sense dead long before we are even laid in a grave. He told the doctor that many people are like a taxidermy deer hanging on a wall. They look good, but inside they're dead. He went on to tell the doctor, you can have a healthy body and you can be active, but our souls at the age of accountability are by nature dead in trespasses and sins. He went on to tell the doctor, he said, Doctor, who shall deliver us from this body of death? At this point, the doctor was very uncomfortable. And he said, Doctor, he made it personal. He said, Have you thanked God that Jesus Christ can? He said to the doctor, he said, Jesus can cleanse our hearts because in him is life. He said, it is Jesus Christ and only Jesus Christ who can revive us. He said, it is only Jesus Christ who can open up the eyes of understanding to spiritual blindness. He said, it is only Jesus Christ who is the true medicine that can heal our sin. He said, it is only Jesus Christ. He said, doctor, however corrupt and however wicked your past is, doctor, this patient said, Jesus Christ is the answer. He could tell the doctor was feeling a little uncomfortable. So he ended his discourse, but he said there's no case of spiritual disease too hard for Jesus Christ. You see, that's a pretty intense introduction. It is. I ain't got nothing else more to say, so let's just look to the text. Luke 5, 12 through 16. While he was in one of the cities, behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing. Oh, man. You can make me clean. Verse 13, and he stretched 
out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. Verse 14, and he ordered him to tell no one. But go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing just as Moses commanded as a testimony to them. But the news about him was spreading even farther. And large crowds were gathering to hear him and to be healed of their sicknesses. But Jesus himself would often slip away to the wilderness and pray. May God have blessing on his word. And um, let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the healing power through Jesus Christ for our sin. Thank you for the substitutionary atonement of Christ. Thank you, Lord, as Brother Sammy Sr. said a couple weeks ago, Jesus did a good job. What profound, rich theological statement that was. I believe the Hebrew writer said it too, Christ is best. We thank you for that, Lord, and we ask and pray now that you would eradicate any type of demonic influences that would come against the, the message of your word. And I pray that we would all see Jesus in this text, in his beauty, in his sinless name we pray. Amen. If I had to sum up the context into two words, I'd say this. Jesus has the power over everyone and over everything. Simple enough, ain't it? Jesus has the power over everyone and everything. And the reason why is you just kick it back to about the past five weeks that we've been studying in the book of Luke. Follow along in your Bible or, or your tablet or uh, whatever device that you have, you can look back and kick it back to, to chapter 4, verses one, thir uh, 1 through 13. Once again, kick it back to chapter 4, verses 1 through 13. Yeshua, Jesus, has the power over everyone and everything. Evidence is in the, in the text. 4, 1 through 13, he's got the power over Satan's uh, dominion. He, he was tempted, he was tried. Hebrews 4, uh, uh, 4.15 says he was tempted in all things yet without sin. He's got power over everyone and everything because in Luke chapter 4 verses 33 through 35 and even verse 41 he's casting out devils. He's got the power over everyone and everything because Luke chapter 4 verses 38 through 40 he's healing mother-in-laws. He's got power over everyone and everything because Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11, which is where we looked at a couple of weeks, the miraculous catch of fish. Remember that? The fishing incident, I think I called it. All this isn't some pontificating cool gospel stories, as cool as they are. There's a, there's a target that needs to be hit with all of these little historical accounts. And the reason is, is because that points to the godness of God. Jesus Christ, okay, is a critical testimony of all of those things, of his divine nature. Truly God, truly man. But this morning, we look at a couple different things here. Okay, we're going to look at two more examples uh, that, that are a critical testimony of his divine nature. This morning, it's going to be obviously the healing of, of leper, uh, leprosy, which I believe in this portion of the scripture, we see in this the main point, uh, apart from all the subject matter, subject matter is all the, the decorations that a lot of cool grace preachers preach today. A lot of times you don't hear the main point in a lot of churches. What a lot of people flock to is these, uh, these, these, these cool style preachers that only preach the subject matter. They never preach the main point of the text. It's like, dude, get to the main point and they won't do it. They'll, 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 they'll spend hours talking about a certain date or where this was at on a map or this or that and that's cool it's it's a cool study but they never get to the main point point. and the main point of this passage this morning is this that this leper is going to it's, it's a picture it's a total picture of how a repentant sinner approaches a holy God they don't get to that point 
And then in next week's lesson, when, when they bring the paralytic man on the mat, you know, all you'll hear are these cool sermons about how it takes teamwork to bring people to Jesus and, and all this, but they never get to the main point. And next week's uh, message in regards to the paralytic being healed, the main point is this, that Jesus has the authority to forgive sin. So, there it is. There it is. First thing I want to look at, though, is, is a little bit of subject matter stuff, but we're not going to camp out with it. And that's, it's hard to determine the exact time of when this happened. And in the, in the, in the realm of theology and a bunch of smart people, they, they argue about the date of when this happened and the method of arrangement is highly disputed. Well, I don't really know, but what I do know, you'll never believe what I know. Guess what? Look at verse 12. That's what we know because it's what's in the text. It was his Galilean ministry and verse 12 says it was in one of the cities or the little villages around Galilee. Man, we can move on now. Pretty simple. I read 25 pages of the method of arrangement of when this actually happened. At the end, I've come to this conclusion. So what? Who cares? Verse 12. Moving on, I'm just going to give you three nuggets of truth from this text that are going to be relatable and applicable and uh, the beauty of the text here. We don't have to bounce all over the Bible to see what's going on here because the first thing that we see is number one, it's a dreaded disease. Look at verse 12. Behold, there was a man covered with leprosy. Huh? That's enough to talk about for a minute. It's a dreaded disease. Now, I think that there's so much emotion that underlines a passage like this. And the reason that I say that is because of all of the ills that can afflict the body, they say leprosy was the worst. So you have to be able to, first of all, before you even approach a text like this, I believe, go ahead and start feeling the intensity, the gravity of his situation. It was a dreaded disease. The Greek word for leper is lepros. Leperos, and it was a, a general term, obviously, for uh, a number of skin conditions. Okay, and then nowadays they might they call it Hansen's uh, Hansen's disease is kind of how it's known today. But um, notice Luke's description here. Notice your text. It says that this man was covered with leprosy. So this is a most intense situation here. It's not just your normal case of leprosy. This man has a more intensity. It, the fact that his leprosy was the most extreme sense of the term. But the beauty of this text is this man is not just desiring uh, healing of his bunion or, or cleansing, okay, from the, from the disease itself. It, it goes much deeper than that. And the reason why it goes much deeper than that is looking back to the Old Testament law in Leviticus chapter 13, because this, 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 he didn't just want the disease to be eradicated. There was much more going on because it really reflects the designation of the leper in Leviticus 13 as being unclean spiritually, not just physically. So we can kind of date the disease back to different writings and pulling down different books and studying this past week on this disease alone. That's why it takes work if you're going to do true Bible preaching. You find yourself studying and learning different things to expound the text. Writings back to 600 BC, we hear about leprosy in China. We hear about it in India and Egypt and the mummified remains. Common in the Old Testament Mosaic Law. And then in 1873, there was a Norwegian scientist named G.H.A. Hansen who later discovered this disease. Okay, and it was uh, caused by bacterium, supposedly. It was uh, communicable through touch and through your breath. So it was very contagious, they say. And from my research, uh, one historian says, quote, leprosy attacks the skin and the peripheral nerves, especially near the wrists, the elbow, and the knees. Mucous membrane. 
It would form lesions on the skin and it would disfigure the face by collapsing the nose and causing the folding of the skin. Sometimes they would call lepers the lion's disease due to the lion-like appearance in their face. Everyone said a popular belief even that I was always told is leprosy eats away the flesh. I found no evidence of that in any of my research. None. So what I did find is a lot of these people cannot feel their hands or their feet so they just unknowingly wear away. So you think about this discorrelation that they, they would have looked like. You, you think about the disfigurement, the abnormality and the defect of what these people would have looked like. And it would have caused them to be feared in society, which probably made them socially backwards. You know, not only that, but they were cut off from society, which would have caused them to experience a psychological breakdown. So now you begin to kind of get in the shoes of a leper, which was my objective. And yes, there was accounts in the, in the Word of God when God cursed people with leprosy. Second uh, Kings 5, uh, Gehazi, Uzziah, Second Chronicles 26, and then even Miriam, Moses' sister, in Numbers 12 for a short season. So there's a good possibility that I'm going to take the position that this man very well could have thought that he was under the curse of God. What do you say? Uh, dreaded disease. Moving on. I also think that this guy was a desperate victim in this sense. Now I know we've got to be careful with the victimization of our society, but hear it in its pure form, if you will. And when he saw Jesus, he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So you think about this tragic situation here. There's no hope with this outcast whatsoever. None. Incurable disease. Stigmatized socially. And under God's curse. So he comes looking for Jesus. It doesn't say that in the text. Yet yeah, does Matthew 8 2. Matthew's account of the narrative says that this guy came looking for Jesus. All right, time out. Lepers don't look for anyone. Lepers only look for other lepers because that's the only people they can relate with. He approached Jesus. That's total forbidden behavior. They weren't even allowed to come near people, man. In fact, Josephus at one point said lepers were barred from Jerusalem. And listen to this. One uh, intelligent encyclopedia of biblical narrative and history that was written, copyrighted back in the 80s, said that they had come up with a law that you weren't allowed to be within six feet of a leper. Sound familiar? And that was written in the 80s. Interesting. He also uh, informed us that you couldn't be with 150 feet of a leper if the wind was blowing from the direction of the leper. You know. Stigmatized. Don't get near him. Alfred Edersheim, in his book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah, on page 492, says, quote, One rabbi refused to eat an egg brought on a street where there was a leper. Another advocated throwing stones at lepers to force them to keep their distance, close quote. Alfred goes on to document, quote, in rabbi teaching, leprosy was second only to contact with a dead body in terms of defilement. He goes on to say, quote, not merely actual contact with the leper, but even his entrance defiled a habitation. And everything in it, to the beams of the roof, even if he put his head into a place, it became unclean, close quote. 
And you think about all the narratives in the Word of God that speak of leprosy. It's important as disciples of Christ, which is a student, that we understand this crucial condition. I'm not saying any of you, but I can think of certain family members that did not want to be around my wife and I because we didn't get the jab. It's the same thing. This leper violated CDC regulations. This leper violated rabbi law. This leper violated the health department's regulations. And the reason why is because, number one, it reveals his desperation. Look at this. He was past any type of fear. He was past any type of shame and heedless to the danger of harming himself and harming other people. He didn't care at this point. He had nothing left to lose and he was coming to Jesus and the leper fell on his face. What's that tell us? It tells us that he was desperate. We also see a reverence and, and worship here because look at what he says in Matthew 8 2. It says that he bowed down. Perskuino is the, 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 the Greek language here. It means he worshiped God. He wasn't just wanting healing for his disease, he wanted to be able to worship the Son of God. The term is used in the New Testament for always worshiping God. And whatever his understanding of the doctrine of Christology and the person and work of Jesus, he didn't know Greek. He didn't understand a lot of things. But it doesn't matter because he was convinced of who Jesus Christ was, that he was sent from God, and he called him Lord. Do you see that? What a rebuke to Peter. Because if you kick it back a couple weeks to chapter 5, you, you, you look at chapter 5, verse 5 after Jesus has exposited and expounded the text of Isaiah in the synagogue, after Jesus has healed the mother-in-law, and now the incident of the fishing situation, when he tells him to cast that net down, and what did Peter say? Master, look at 5.5. Five. Simon answered and said, Master. That's just a respectful term. And it took the holiness of Christ in revealing a divine miracle for Peter to realize what it says in verse 8 of chapter 5 when he realized his sinfulness before the holiness of Christ and he said what? Go away from me, Lord. An acknowledgement of his deity. But yet the leper got it right from Jump Street. Telling. Telling. Not only that, but it reveals his urgency. There's a lot of urgency here. Look at what it says. He implored him. It's in the present tense in the Greek. It just means it was a constant state of begging. Constantly begging. Sinful, outcast, wretched, miserable, nowhere else to turn. One word. He wondered if he was willing to do so. What's that tell us? There's humility there. Humility. He didn't make demands of what God was going to do like God is some personal bellhop or genie in a bottle. He, he didn't doubt Jesus' ability. He just wondered if he was willing to do so. And the last thing, as Brother Sammy Lloyd always says, he put faith in action. Faith in action. I thought of you. I love that when you always say that. Put your faith in action. And that's what he did, affirming his confidence, man, that, that Jesus had clearly displayed many times the power to heal and make him clean. Right there is a picture of the repentant sinner approaching Jesus Christ. There's your plan of salvation. That's my commentary on here, repent, confess, be baptized, and live faithful. Because a lot of people have no clue what that means. And I appreciate Walter Scott, the, the five finger, okay, even though he left out faithfulness until death and they added that in. 
But what, what does all that mean? Hear, confess, repent, believe, be baptized, live faithful. You, you take an unchurched person and say that plan of salvation to them, they're going to have no clue what you're talking about. These are words that they have no clue what they mean. You have to explain it. And you just can't expect people to understand what these truths mean. So there's an expanded commentary on the plan of salvation. And here's why I say that. You're going to approach Jesus, then first and foremost, you have to come in desperation. Yeah, and it would be rather biblical. It might look silly, crawling to the cross in God's terms. Casting aside self-righteous efforts to save yourself because of Isaiah 64, 6, the filthy garments that we are. And then you come in reverence, affirming him as the divine Lord of glory. He's God, I'm not. Amen? You come in reverence, Romans 10, 9. You know, then you come with Acts 4, 12, that he's the only Savior. That's reverence, okay? And then they come with a sense of urgency, you're not going to wait until next Sunday. You're not going to wait until you get old. What are you waiting on? You, you come with urgency right now. In fact, when Peter preached, they interrupted the sermon, didn't they? There has to be a sense of urgency. So Paul said in 2 Corinthians 6 2, now is the acceptable time. Now is the day of salvation. And they come with humility, Matthew 5 3, being poor in spirit, deserving nothing, knowing that they have nothing in and of themselves to offer a holy God. The price has been paid only through Jesus Christ. And then you put that faith in action and you obey what God has said. And what he has said is to repent and be immersed. It's a watery grave where you are bestowed forgiveness and the gift of Holy Spirit. Amazing. Third point. Notice the divine compassion. Look at verses 13 through 16. And he stretched out his hand and touched him saying, I am willing. And the sovereign love and compassion of Jesus Christ, amazing. And he responded in love. He said, I am willing, be cleansed. And immediately the leprosy left him. Once again, healed instantly. None of this progressive healing stuff. He didn't need physical therapy. This was an instant healing. No lingering recovery. Jesus said, I am willing. And that deserves some special notice, doesn't it? Because what do we learn about God in that? We learn something. We learn that the mind of Jesus Christ towards sinners, that he is willing. Young people, this goes for you too. Old people, young people, he's willing. And if you're here this morning, right there where you sit, and you're not in Jesus Christ, and everything is just a joke and funny, well, then understand this. Whether you're old or a teenager, it's not because Jesus is not unwilling to save you. The reason why is Jesus is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He would have gathered Jerusalem like a mother gathering the chickens, remember? But they didn't want to come. The blame of the ruin of sinners is straight upon yourself. You want to follow your will and not Christ's will. He's willing, isn't he? He's willing to save. Second thing I want to point out is notice what took place after the healing. He said, don't be bragging about this on Facebook. Don't be twerking, tweetering. Not twerking. Forgive me. <laughs> tweeting. Whatever all that stuff is. Shows you how much I know. Well, you know a lot of you will. Dude, I didn't even know what that term meant. Anyways, don't be tweeting this. But he said, instead, go and show yourself to the priest and make an offering for your cleansing just as Moses commanded. See that? 
under the Torah law, there was a process that the cleanse was going to be back in, reestablished back in society. There was things that he had to do. For an example, uh, he would go to the temple. There would be an examination by the priest. He would have to shave. Uh, he, he would have to take a bath. They st the Jewish people still do this today. It's called a mikveh. It's a, it's a purity pool, basically. Okay? Women in their menstrual have to go into a mikveh. Uh, converts to Judaism has to go into a mikveh. Okay? They, they basically cherry-plucked it out of the Leviticus passage. But he would have to wash his clothes and offer multiple animal sacrifices along with Leviticus 14, grain and oil. So this wasn't just some thing like, oh, I'm clean now. He had to go, it was, a, it was an eight-day experience. Okay, big deal. It's 2022 and we're in Peekneyville. Come on with it. Will you think about this for a minute? Think about this. Jesus knew very well that the last days of the Levitical institutions were close at hand. Would you agree to that? Jesus knew. The last days of Levitical ceremonies were coming to an end. Okay? They're going to be laid aside forever. Yeah, okay, well, good. Well, well, there's another lesson here for Christians. You say, what lesson? And I call to the stand J.C. Ryle, my fave, and listen to what Ryle says, quote, Let us take heed that we do not despise the ceremonial law of the Old Testament because its work is done. Let us beware of neglecting those parts of the Bible which contain it under the idea that the Christian in the gospel has nothing to do with it. It is true. 1 John 2, 8, the darkness is past and the true light now shineth. Ryle says, we have nothing to do now with altars, sacrifices, or priests, okay? Those who wish to revive them are like men who light a candle at the noonday. But true as this is, Ryle says, we must never forget that the ceremonial law is still full of instruction. It contains the same gospel in the bud which we now see in the full flower. Rightly understood, we shall always find it throwing strong light into the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the Bible reader who neglects to study the ceremonial law will always find at last that by the neglect his soul will suffer damage. Close quote. Spot on. And the last thing I want to point out is our Lord Jesus in his diligence of private prayer in the text because he made time for the secret devotion. See that? In light of the chaos of the multiple crowds, he made time for the secret devotion. And I'm quite afraid that there's possibly maybe even some here today who do not strive to imitate Christ in this matter of private devotion. Many folk know Church of Christ doctrine. Many people have read the definitions and the conclusions of Calvinism by Dr. Terry Peer. Many people have read Donald Nash's discourse on predestination. Many people have studied diligently the homiletics of Dr. H. Lee Mason's or he read or subscribed to the Restoration Herald. Many people have read At the Hands of the Apostles by Dr. James E. Smith. Many people have read The Discourse of Acts 2.38 by Dr. R. J. Kidwell. Many people know frontwards and backwards the Discourse, Doctrine, and Articles on the Lord's Supper by Dr. R. C. Foster. As important and as, as great as these things are, you can know those until the cows come home and never once get alone with God. And I'm afraid that's the way it is. Why is it that there's so much religious work? Why is it that there's so many sermons, sermon, 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 so few saved, so much machinery, so little effort in the Lord's church, so much busy work, but yet so few brought to Jesus Christ? I believe the reason why is because there isn't enough private prayer. Private prayer. So what? The most successful worker for Christ isn't someone 
that can sound cool or even write articles. The most successful worker for Christ is the one who's on his knees. Surely you're not going to end that way. I don't know what else to say. But I do know that God has given a plan of salvation that he extends to anyone and everyone whosoever would believe and obey. Trust and obey. There it is. If you have any questions about this, we as the leadership here or whoever would love to talk to you about this and open up the Bible and to share with you how one can enter into the light of God's glorious gospel. And Jesus said, you're with me or you're against me, didn't he? So you, there's no way of, well, he's halfway saved or she's halfway saved. You're in or out. And there it is on the screen. It's not our opinions or creeds or confessions, or patristics of church fathers. It's the essence of the fatherhood of God and it's in his word. And we want to be faithful to that. You can make that decision any time. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word and we thank you that no matter what, we see clearly, Father, that you are willing that every one of us are spiritually lepers in the sight of God. We have a much worse disease than we could even imagine. But praise be to God that through Jesus Christ, you've given us the true ointment, the true oil, the true medicine, which is the blood of Jesus Christ. Nothing but the blood. We are so thankful, Father, that the life of the flesh is in the blood. And we're thankful that through Jesus Christ that you've given us a remedy that we can be saved from God on that great day of his wrath and judgment. Saved, born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this, Father. What a great privilege it is. And if there's any here that are playing games with you, Lord, we pray that you would bring deep conviction that they may turn from their sin and obey you. We love you and keep us close to you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.